Hi, everyone. We're going to give it a couple more minutes just to let everyone join us, and then we're going to go ahead and get started. So just hang tight. While we're waiting for everyone to join us though, feel free to leave in the chat where you're joining us from. I see a lot of familiar names, but if you're new and this is your first time, make sure you use the chat feature and let us know where you're joining us from. Hey, Katarina from North Carolina. Hi, Neil from DC. Jennifer from Maryland. Jamil from Las Vegas. Akshita from Africa. Welcome. Ada from Port St. Lucie. Mrs. Ogden's class from Tampa. Welcome, y'all. Wow, you guys are from all over. Safia and Virginia, welcome. Well, welcome everyone. We're gonna give it one more minute just to make sure all of our attendees are in and then we're gonna go ahead and get started. Okay, well, it looks like everyone is, maybe a few people are still joining us as stragglers, but we're gonna go ahead and get into it. If you miss any parts of today's lecture, you can make sure to check it out on Facebook or we're gonna post it on our YouTube channel. So if you join us late and you wanna catch the beginning, make sure to check those places. But without further ado, hello and good afternoon or good morning or good evening from wherever you're joining us from. My name is Laura LeBur and I'm a marine science educator at the Smithsonian Marine Ecosystem Exhibit. Welcome back to our fall series of Career Dives, Live Conversations in Marine Science. So if you're new, this series will continue to highlight the career tracks, interests, and projects of marine science professionals working with the Smithsonian Marine Station and the Marine Ecosystems Exhibit. So like I said, if you're, if you're joining, new to joining us, please let us know in the chat where you're joining us from. I know some of you have already done that and it's so cool to see where everyone is joining us from because you're from all over. Um, so please feel free to use the chat and let us know. As everyone joins the webinar though, or is already in, maybe um, you know these features already, but I'm gonna go over them with you really quickly. So you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask questions of our guests throughout the program. So the Q&A button is the one at the bottom of your screen that has the two speech bubbles. You can submit a question at any time. We'll try to get through as many questions as possible, and I'll ask them as they're applicable to our panelists. We do get a high influx of questions though. So if for some reason your question is not answered and you really want an answer, feel free to reach out to us at our email address. It's smseducation at si.edu. And one of our educators will put that in the chat for you. Um, so today's program is gonna be about an hour. And I think we're ready to get started. So let me introduce our wonderful panelists to you today. Our panelist is Iris Segura Garcia. She's an accomplished marine ecologist who uses genetics to unscramble ocean mysteries. Her areas of research encompass several areas of evolutionary ecology and conservation genetics, such as ecological speciation, stock identity, and population structure. And I know these are really big words, but don't worry, there's not gonna be a test. 
Iris has used several genetic approaches to understand and identify marine biodiversity and their responses to environmental changes and fishing activity and pressures, which I think is really cool. She's worked all over the world in several geographic locations, including the Mesoamerican Reef System, the Florida Keys, Gulf of California, Eastern Tropical Pacific, and Myanmar in Southeast Asia. And now she's currently working in the, our backyard here in Fort Pierce, Florida in the Indian River Lagoon. So Iris, it's so great to welcome you to Career Dives. And do you wanna go ahead and turn your camera on, share your screen? Sure. Hi. Hi, Loretta. Thanks for the introduction. Um, thank you for all the attendees. Um, I'm excited and very ready to tell you more about that. All right. Well, let's, let's go all the way back to the beginning of your career. How did you even get interested in marine science? Well, let me share my screen quickly. Um, uh, well, it was, I think I would say it was early in my, in my early days as a child, like my mom shared her distant romance with the ocean. She was passionate about the ocean, loved the ocean, but not much about marine life because we don't know much about marine life. She was so afraid of the ocean. Like when we go to the beach, like as you see in this photo in, in, in the left, it was, the, we just, when every time we go to the beach, just get your feet wet and go out of the ocean because something was gonna happen. So I didn't get to, to learn more about ocean life when I was as, as growing up, but we definitely, I, I have a lot of love for animals. So there was like ocean and animals, but I didn't know more about and, like money in life. But it only was like love of animals that at some point made me think like I could be a veterinarian. Well, as growing up also, I like, was like rescuing thousands of cats. So I would say my life, like I, I foresee my life in like rescuing cats and being in tears all the time. So no, I was like discarded from the very beginning. Like it's not gonna be. And my family, the growing, I grew up in a, in a very um, uh, conservative family. Uh, in Mexico City, not very wealthy. I was actually the first kid to go to college. So I think it was, I mean, the idea of my mom and my grandma was like, she's gonna get a degree and either in, a, in an administrative career or maybe a lawyer, and then she's gonna get a job. No, and so what are the family like? But, and another factor for me, like not getting into science, like a like, thing about scientists in, early in my, in my years, is like in Mexico, we don't have the, the same culture as here in the United States. Like when it's time to go to college, you you think about where you're going to college. Here in Mexico, you, your career is what, basically what is close to you. It's not like in Mexico, the kids, or at least not back in my days, not even a, and for a girl, it was like no questions asked. You don't leave the house to go and pick your college. So basically the ladies leave the house when someone married them. So. No, I didn't have this like, oh, where is my career in science going to be? Like, I didn't have that. But yeah, I mean, my mom invested a lot in my education. She already, he let me pick. Like when I was in, in high school, in my last years of high school, um, I was a great, a very good student. And my professor saw some science in me. So they mentored me very well and showed me and opened my eyes into to science and especially in biology. And told me that biology was an, an, an option for me in Mexico City, I didn't have to leave it, leave, leave my house. <laughs> so I, they, they advised my mom to take me for, for a visit into, into the university, the, the institutes, the how would research it, where it's like about how, what is being a biologist? So yeah, she was open to the idea and she took me in to, for a visit in, in to the, to the Biology Institute in my, later on in my university, the UNAM is a national university in Mexico, the largest and oldest university in, in Latin America. And I'm very proud of being part of, of this university. There is it's the best place you can study sciences in Mexico. They have all kinds of institutes, biological sciences, biomedical, biology, marine sciences, um, astro, astro, um, astrophysics, I mean, you name it. They're all this kind of sciences are in this house. It's an amazing campus. This is the main campus, but they are branching out all, all over Mexico. So in this photo is my, my library and the new library that they opened the year that I actually joined the, the university. It's a beautiful um, library. 
It's an amazing library. Actually, the first time I visited the university, I saw in front of the metro, you have to take a metro. I have to take public transportation. And I saw the, the, the structure and the building and the sculpture. And I was like, oh, I wish that would be my, 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 my school. And here you go, it's my university. It was my school, so I, it's, it was a lot of fun. So in, bio, in, in, in this program, you don't get into really like biology and animals and things until the, probably the second year. The first year is all maths, biology, chemistry. So, but early in my, in my second year, I start um, taking the zoology courses. And uh, once you pass all the, like, the, the, the protozoans and parasites, you start to go into marine invertebrates. And that was fascinating. That was just like the first like spark of, oh, marine life exists. So in this course, we, they took us for, the field trip was in the, in the reefs of the, of the coast of Veracruz in the Gulf of Mexico. And for this field trip, it was required for us to bring fins, snorkel, and mask, which I didn't know what it was. I mean, I know what it was, but I didn't have one as many of my other classmates. So here I go, my mom, going in excursion in Mexico City, which it's not like you go to the dye shop here in Florida or in Cancun. So it was like an expedition for her to get me this gear to come to my field work, um, to my field trip, sorry. So. That was exciting. A little bit embarrassing, I have to say, because I didn't know anything about marine life. So when my friends or classmates go and jump into the water, they start recognizing all kind of things. Like, did you see the Christmas worm? Did you see this? And do you see that? Or they were like, I don't know any of the things. I mean, I know them from the book, but I never get to see them in, in the ocean. That was kind of <laughs> anyway. So um, that was my first time in snorkel. It wasn't that hard. It was. I took it very well. But one of the amazing parts of this trip was seeing my professor having a, a free dive five meters down and squeeze a huge sponge. Like we, we, we saw that sponge, we, we reviewed the, the sponges already in, in class, but then she go and squeeze all the land and then she went out to the surface again and said, you see, that's what I was telling you about sponge. They used to like sponge and they were like, so, and I was telling more about the sponge and I was like, wow, how she does that. And, and then you start showing us um, like the jellies and the ten fours, like the comb jellies and all kinds of marine life there. And I was just like, wow, yeah, this, this is awesome. And that's what I'm gonna do. So I read, and this is the first time it was just like my spark of marine life is like, this is gonna be me. If I'm gonna do biology, I'm gonna do marine biology. So I keep looking into that. I continue taking all my courses and botanies and evolution courses, but I was really like, it's gonna be marine life. So I keep looking into that and I had the opportunity or an opportunity came into my, my side. Like there was um, a dolphin program in Mexico city. Like it's like in the Institute, like just like a few doors from my school. Like there was someone that was probably taking volunteers to, to, to conduct this uh, dolphin population project in the Gulf of Mexico. And it was Dr. Um, Alberto Delgado Estrella, but by then he was doing his PhD on this. So he took me as a volunteer and he taught me many things about dolphins. I mean, many things, many aspects of the biology of dolphins. He told me how to conduct photo ID, all the traditional me methods to do the uh, population biology in dolphins, how to track the, the dolphin marks the natural marks on dolphins to learn more about their biology. I learned how to age a dolphin, how to process samples and, and skeletons and skulls for the collections. So I was a bit, like very productive for me to volunteer for, for, this, uh, for this project. And later on, I met his colleague, the, uh, the, uh, Dr. Joel Ortega, who was in, um, enrolled in a PhD program in Texas A&M. So they saw like my genuine interest on, on, on dolphin research. So they encouraged me to apply for a scholarship. For, I was, I was, that was my, my third, fourth year of, um, of my of my program, of my biology program. So I was like, I need to choose a, a thesis for, for, for to graduate, because in Mexico we do like a, a research thesis, a research project to get your degree. So I have, to, I need to choose that. I need to really go into that. So that was an opportunity. I didn't know the scholarship could be if it was available for me, but I learned that. So I applied for a scholarship to do research in to do this to conduct this research in Texas A and M, and I got it. So that was fantastic. I just needed to finish my. My, all my classes, wrap up things, put all my paperwork and off I go to Texas. But the story was a little bit different. It was not that easy. The university oh. went into a strike for months. 
So during this time, uh, I start volunteering and now in this time for the Institute of Marine Sciences and participate in different um, campaigns. So there was the, the ocean in, in, from a different platform, which was, is also amazing. So again, more ocean sciences, how to do plants on toes, so plants on how to process the samples, even my cetacean work, like in some of the, in a couple of the cruises, the Texas A&M group participate and I learned how to conduct dolphin cetacean research and sightings and record and data from a different platform. It's like in a big ship, like when, what I did uh, for, for Alberto's program was from a small from a small boat, so there was like a, a, a different platform. So I learned a lot of things during these months, which <laughs> months of strike. I think it was like probably over a month, over a year. Sorry, so it was a long time. So in one of these cruises, um, I get to learn to meet two very important people in my life. So I call them my academic parents. That was back in June in, in June 1989, and the, this cruise was. Um, uh, the focus was on deep uh, crustaceans. Uh, we have like, oh, we were looking for batinomos, which is the, the photo that um, it's on Erin's um, screen. That's the batinomos, it's like a giant isotope. So we were collecting these guys, um, all kinds of um, deep lobsters, uh, deep sea lobsters and shrimp. And there was more cetacean, but all deep sea. So um, they like me, I guess. And they, uh, Enrique offered me a thesis project for my, for my degree, for my undergrad thesis. Um, I think you call it a senior project. So um, so he offered me that and it's like, uh, so with lobsters in the Caribbean and you know, dive course and accommodation scholarship. It was kind of, here you go, you're very depressing. But I was like, no, I, I'm a dolphin researcher and I'm, I have already a scholarship in Texas and I'm waiting for me. And I'm gonna do this and that with dolphins. So no, thank you. So I didn't take that opportunity then, uh, but the, the, the strike went on. And at some point, and I, I just want to, to quickly say like Patricia and Enrique were my, my first like mentors in research, like, like this, uh, from designing a project to, all, to, to become a, a scientific paper, my first scientific paper. They were my colleagues at some point, and now they are friends and even my family. I think people don't understand maybe, like you had two months to go until you were gonna finish before the, the university went on strike. And so you thought it was gonna be over like kind of shortly and it just kept yeah. going on and on. And you were like, I just wanna be done with my undergraduate degree. So I need to pick like, am I gonna wait for Texas A&M when the strike is over and they can process my paperwork or, do I really want to take this project, which is the lobster research and finish my degree so that I can move on to the next thing. And I think like that choice as you have here with the balance is like really ch changed your entire journey. Yeah, and as I said before, like like being in a family that they, they I mean, they invest in your, in, in your career and your education because you need to move forward and make your living and work hard and make your living. So it's like, wait for this amazing opportunity that it might be lost. And actually when I was taking these choices because Texas told me we cannot wait and, and hold your scholarship any longer, you have to apply it again or move forward, do marine science is in a different area, but you're gonna get your degree and move forward and jump into the workforce. So that was my choice. And actually it was, it was a little bit tricky to do the way they exposed that opportunity to me because dolphins apparently somewhere in the world interact with lobsters and with the lobster fishery. So he was like, you know, you can do something with dolphins, the fishery, blah, blah, but this happens in Cuba. Like, do no in Puerto Morelos, but I end up. So, I don't know, it was kind of like the hook. And, uh, so it worked out. I love these people. I love the research that I conducted. So you have to balance you now sometimes like, you have these and you move forward and you wait for the dream and it might happen. So it went, it went well. So that was the first time I left my home, my, my mom's house and moved in, in October 19, 1999 to Puerto Morelos to the Reef Academic Unit in, in the Caribbean. And this is the photo of how it looks now. And it hasn't changed much. Like this build, well, it, it has changed. This building here was the student's accommodation. So I live here in the first, in the third floor. 
with this amazing view of the Caribbean Sea. It was kind of living in the resort, like after being with your mom in Mexico City in an apartment and going into an academic resort in the Caribbean. No, it was not a bad choice, I guess. So yeah, so I told you, you know, like dolphin, the dolphin, sorry, diving was included in the package. So I never joined the dive team in my university because it was expensive and it would take a lot of time. So diving, uh, it was the first time I was gonna dive in my life. So I knew like the dive, the dive team back in Mexico City, they practice in a, in a pool. So when I arrived here and I was walking from leaving my luggage into my apartment, to go back to the lab, I was like, well, yes, yeah, so where am I, where am I going to dive? I'm mean, going to learn diving. And where's the pool? And they pointed at the Caribbean. <laughs> and so they reflect like going, that's your pool. And I was like, what? I'm going to learn diving in the ocean? Like, I don't know. But no, I mean, it went well. I, I have to say the first, the first immersion was a little bit freak out for the first minute, probably. But this guy here in this photo, um, Fernando, is the, te the research te technician in the lab. And he has been the dive officer forever. So his skills are amazing and he just passed them on. He's, he, I learned diving with, with a, a great professional in diving. So and I get to dive pretty, pretty much every day for this lab, like looking for lobster, counting lobsters, or bringing lobster for my experiment. So I can look uh, for my for this experiment. I get to to spy lobsters. Basically, I wanted to learn more about the the behavior of the spotted spiny lobster, but we didn't know, don't don't know much about it, or we didn't know much about it by then, uh, because it's not a commercial species in Mexico. So most of the research is conducted in the commercial species, which is the Florida spiny lobster. Well, it's not here as Florida spiny lobster. It's like common Caribbean spiny lobster. So it was a very neat. Um, um, the experiment, I put cameras in, in, in trash bins and spy them for 24 seven. Every time, every, every hour I record 10 minutes of their behavior and for three weeks, I think. And then I, for months, I go to see the TV, like reality show on lobsters and record all <laughs> the behaviors. And so it was pretty neat. And so, but I got my degree, so I was pretty good, and I got my first paper, so that was pretty, pretty good. And got scuba certified all in one. Yeah, there you go. It was all in the package. That was pretty good. And first time I live out of my home, so like I, it was definitely um, a growing step in my, in, my, in, in my life. And for those of you who aren't familiar with spotted lobsters or spiny lobsters, they're very similar throughout the Caribbean. They kind of have a very similar... I mean, Iris, you probably think they look totally different, but if you if you haven't seen them much, they look kind of similar, um, but spiny lobsters obviously are spiny and they have all of these things all over their shell, um, but they occupy similar sort of habitats. And so if you're familiar enough with the spiny lobster, a spotted one just looks a little different, um, but they are kind of in the same area. Yeah. So now you finish your degree and you have an, another choice to make. Well, yeah, so mommy told you, you have to get your career and join the workforce. So that's what I did. And I applied for, a do for, for my first job as a dolphin trainer uh, because I wanted to conduct dolphin research, right? So that was my aim. So in my mind, um, and based on what in, in the, the previous uh, project that I was, uh, I was volunteering, they, this research was funded by a dolphinarium. So I thought like all the dolphinariums will have like a research department and I will live my dream like in the flipper movie, like you have the bay with dolphins and you have your lab and you just studied dolphins right in front of you. But no, it was a, it was a bit different. <laughs> so based on my, 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 expert, my experience on dolphins, I, I got promoted very, very fast in, in as a dolphin trainer and then like assigned to different um, tasks. And one of my tasks was prepare mini lectures for the trainers and and the interns that uh, that were in, in in the dolphinarium, and so for this lecture, I had to prepare myself and read and books and look for literature and research papers, and uh, all these make me miss all the academia and and get more questions and more research questions that I want to resolve and want to resolve the question that Alberto wanted to resolve. And one of the things I learned is like now the way we were applying genetics to resolve all these questions and there. They, you get answers faster than all these traditional methods, just like the photo ID and follow the, the natural marks of the dolphin in, on time. 
So it's just like, that's what I want to do. I want to learn how these dolphins, they are the same dolphins that we see along the coast of Mexico. They are this Veracruz or they are from Tabasco or they family or they're no family. I want to know more about them. So I start thinking about graduate school and put a, a proposal together to start applying and look for opportunities. And yeah, I, I got an opportunity. Uh, one, I think one of the first professors that respond to me was in Spain and what is in Spain. And he offered me a project with, to resolve these questions, but not based on genetics, but based on parasite laws. So I was in a one of look at worms in dolphins and find this. I was like, that sounds cool, interesting, but I don't know if I want to do this for five years and leave genetics um, like aside. I was not really sure. So, and my second choice was stay in Mexico for a master degree, two years, and also get a taste of what is research, what is molecular ecology and genetics um, for me. So I went that route. So this is my choice too in my career. So I stayed in Mexico. I, I knew that there was this new faculty, Dr. Axar Rocha Olivares, who started um, um, molecular ecology lab in CCS, which is a well-known institution for oceanology, both biological and physical and sciences in, in general, like higher education. So um, he, was, he was new and there was one of his students was doing dolphins. So I was like, that's very, that, that kind of fits, right? So, so I sent him my proposal and he liked it. And he's like, um, yeah, I really like your thing. I can help you to do this research. I have funds to do that. You have to apply, of course, if you are accepted into the institution, you are very welcome. But I don't work in the Gulf of Mexico, but you can do this in the Gulf of California. And I mean, have you heard that the Gulf of California is the aquarium of the world? So that was very appealing. Um, although Ensenada was not very appealing to me, but like living in the Caribbean, blah, 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 like the old colors and stuff, that was not very appealing, but I took that choice and it's amazing. It, it was, it was, um, it was a, a very clever de de decision. AXA is very knowledgeable on evolution and molecular ecology. On the other side, um, so I left, I mean, be before going um, for, um, forward to my, my mentors. I, I left the aquarium, quit the aquarium, um, a few months, um, like four months about that before I um, started my master's because I wanted to volunteer in access uh, lab and have the feeling of what, what genetics, what, what kind of work you do and start helping extracting DNA for other projects that were going on, other students, uh, prepare PCRs and so on. So um, then I applied of course and I got it. Um, uh, um, 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 yeah, so I choose, I mean, an, another professor that, or mentor that I choose like, um, to, for, my, for, my, for this research was direct, um, Dr. Lorenzo Rojas Bracho, but he was like in the management party. He's the director of the Marine Mammal Commission in, in Mexico. So I knew that this, uh, the, the question that I was going to resolve will help to distinguish uh, probably two population stocks. So that would help to, to for, for management, manage the decision. So I would like to have this, the two, like the science and the, the how to say, like the hands-on part, the like decision-making part in, into my wow. research, involved in my research. So basically my research was um, to, to distinguish two types of, uh, ecotypes of bottom, of bottom of dolphins. Like one apparently used more the offshore waters and the other one more coastals, what sometimes they mix. And so we don't know if they were like actually two genetic identities, two population identities or not. So that's what we helped to resolve. And we decided there were two different um, stocks and they should be managed differently. So that was my, my research about. And I just, I, I just want to <laughs> show you in this photo in that where Lorenzo is. This is kind of, if you are in Cicese, in the, up in the hill, which is in the hill, and when, when I started, uh, Axel was just starting his lab. He was not very well equipped. Now he's fantastic. He's just, wow, like a first world like, laboratory. And so we didn't have too much equipment then. So we go from preparing DNA extra extractions here in, in his lab, going all the way to Hill to the university here where they let us use their um, equipment, then go all the way passing um, oceanology to biotechnology to do something else and then come back to there. So to get one PCR done, I mean, it was like, it took a day basically. So it was like, the, it's gonna take a little bit longer than two years. 
but no, I was very lucky because these two guys, I have like great connections and, co and collaborate a lot with, with NOAA, with Southwest Fisher Science Center, which from CCS door to door to, to NOAA, to, the, to, to La Jolla, and to lab in, the lab in La Jolla was like an hour and a half. It was the time, the time that you do in the border, but it was super handy and very useful to have these collaborations in there. So they helped me with sampling. They helped me with, I get a lot of work done when AXA take us for some, some lab board trips there. So you get all your work done. So it was, it was really good to have these, these connections. That's a really cool way to build networks too, from Mexico to the United States and like to work together and collaborate. I think that's one of the biggest parts that I enjoy about science is I mean, this year we're not really doing a lot of them, but the symposiums and the conferences and just getting those opportunities to be in the same room with these people and like get to meet them or see them. I mean, I've like fangirled over people that I've cited on papers and then you get to meet them in person and it's like, oh my God, I've cited you like a million times in this paper. Exactly. And it has happened with Noah, like, like dolphins. I mean, a lot of cetaceans are in the, in the Pacific coast and all these papers I have to review and, and literature that I have, I mean, all the, the, the main researchers of, of dolphin and, and biology and ecology were there in the same building. Like every time I go to, from lab to lab or door to door and I just pass and read, oh, this one is here. Oh, that one is here too. And it was just so exciting to have all the, the names in this building it was it was super cool. And I get to know them, all of them. And, and I, I, up to now, I'm probably still collaborating with them. And they hit me a lot for my PhD later too. And you will see. <laughs> okay. That's pretty cool. So you finished your master's, but you one of the biggest part of finishing your master's is writing everything up into publication. Oh yeah. Yeah. It, 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 I mean, between the, my, my degree to degree it took me a, um, like over a year probably. And I was writing my paper uh, and I was building my proposals for, for PhD. So in the meantime, I use other skills to survive and also to refresh my mind after this research. So while my, my master's, I also learned how to make wine and Ensenada for some people that don't know, it's like a, one of the main regions for wine in Mexico. So I learned how to make wine. I grow grapes and, and but also I grow a lot of veggies and, and prepare marmalades and, and salsas. And every Thursday, um, for this year, <laughs> I I went to the to the institute and sell my my produce and veggies. Uh, so I was I was kind of like an, I'm not, uh, surviving with another skill that is not science while you are preparing your your next step and, and your papers. And yeah, this is how I, I I actually move into the next step in my PhD. But one of the reviewers on my paper was um, kind of the the father of the genetics in in, in citations. So. This is when I met Dr. Russ Halsell to, to move forward into my choice tree. So he was the first to distinguish the two ecotypes, the coastal and the offshore, but in the Atlantic coast. And he reviewed my paper. Then later on, I met him in, in, a, in an international conference in San Diego, and he invited me to, to build more into my research in his lab in England, in Durham, England, and the Northeast of England. So I was really excited, and it was kind of like, a hard choice to make, I would say, because do you, again, you have to leave things behind, leave friends behind, leave your life behind a bit. But I, it, yeah, I think at this point, like Ensenada was my home base, kind of. Um, and of course, to conduct this research, like it, we're going to build more into the Bordelnosophian research. We also wanted to include a second species, like have like a similar pattern of coastal offshore, but it, in this time it was kind of offshore, uh, coastal offshore, but also the, the main distinction, the visual distinction was the length, the length of the beak. And the first time this pattern was um, distinguished uh, was in the Asia-Tropical Pacific. And then later on, they distinguished this pattern in the Mediterranean, in the Indian Ocean, and so on. So they, we didn't know they were the same species or not. Ross has another student working in, with populations in the Mediterranean and the, and the Eastern Atlantic. So we really want to know what's happening. What was the evolution story of this dolphin in this species in the in the tropical Pacific? So of course, to conduct this research, that implies more samples, new samples, because we, we're not counting on the uh, common dolphins, sorry. Um, so I got a lot of help from back home. So all my my network that I that I built while, while in my in my masters. 
I during this time, I was a member of ICME, which is like an, an NGO to study marine mammals in, in Ensenada. So all the, the kids that were there, um, the girls basically <laughs> helped me a lot in my to conduct my 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 field work because I, I cannot just go in a, in a, a small boat and go and start getting my samples. So um, so that was very helpful to have all these logistic help. Uh, Gisela was also um, a researcher in in CSS and helped me a lot. He's put a lot of uh, boat time for for my research. So I got a lot of logistic um, help from back home and also Noah is still supporting me with samples. And to learn more about um, this um, ecological speciation and how dolphins um, differentiate based on, on their ecology, I use another skill that I learned from a great friend that was my professor in my master's but in the community ecology. She used uh, mostly uh, stabilized isotopes to resolve ecological questions, especially traffic ecology. So I also use this method. So it was a combination of genetics and stable isotopes to see how dolphins make, um, I mean, choices in ec ecological and preferences lead to, to different evolution patterns in these two species. So that was pretty, pretty much my, like an abstract of my, my PhD research. Eris, you mentioned about the different sizes of the beaks. Will you go back to the next, the previous slide and show our viewers like what that looks like in, in a real life sense? Yeah, so this is the long beak. Uh, so this is the beak of the dolphin. So this is a slightly, a slightly larger and thinner than this one. This is the common bottle and dolphin and this is the, probably the, the ones that you see more often, but these patterns do exist. These also have a little bit more yellowish um, um, spot here then this one is more grayish they're smaller i will say and grayer than than these guys so there are these morphological things that they evolve and like in in, in parallel with other traits and that makes them to be two different species actually after my research these these guys are called is are now recognized as subspecies so that was pretty cool like yeah, it worked. We have some good findings that help to 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 make these, these, these distinctions. But so. when you're in the field and you're just looking off boats, like they they do look similar, and it's not until you start taking these samples and you understand like their their genomes and their genetic history that they're definitely different enough to classify as subspecies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you have, a, I mean, you kind of educate your eye to see these things like, oh, yeah, this is smaller, or this is grayer. But I mean, these guys are not like, you took a photo? No, it's just like, pew, 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 pew. so it's like, oh, that was a, a, a long beak or a short beak. Or there was a, there are a thousand or ten. Or is it, there's, you have to really train your eye to, to, to read these guys in the water. And they're so quick too. You're like, wait, did you see it? No, I didn't see it. Did you see it? Yeah. And then you're looking here and, you're like, and then Whoop! like they don't know where to look. And these guys, like the, their schools are like hundreds of dolphins. There is like all the time. It is like, I mean, you can see like small groups. There's another distinction between these uh, the coastal and the offshore. The offshores, of course, like to protect more more the the the, the members of, of of the herd. They are thousands of dolphins, and sometimes they are mixed species. In the offshore, there are smaller numbers, and yeah, I mean, there are smaller numbers. <laughs> but yeah, when I, get, I, I think what I was going to say is like when you see them in the offshore and you are like cruising, and then you start like some like splash here, splash here, and suddenly, like suddenly, honestly, in seconds, it's like it's like the water is boiling. It's like thousands of them. It's just it's super cool. Wow. I love to see them. Well, we're going to finish up talking about your PhD, but I just want to remind everyone in the audience, if you have any questions, um, make sure to ask them to Iris in the Q&A and we'll get to them. Um, we haven't had any questions yet. So I just wanted to remind everybody that if you do come up with an interesting question that you want to ask Iris while we're talking, please go ahead and put it in the Q&A for us. Um, but Iris, I imagine our viewers are kind of curious to know how you transitioned from completing your PhD and your other degrees to working with us at the Smithsonian. Do you want to talk, talk about how that journey happened? And no dolphins, right? <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, of course, you finish your PhD, you graduate as President Harry Potter, and it's like, I could stay here. I love it here. But 
you also have like some visa restrictions that you have to go by. You can apply for jobs, you can apply for, there was some, I remember it was like an amazing lecturer op op option or opportunity, I would say, in, in Scotland. And I was like, off I go. I said, no, no, you have to go back to your country, apply and start all the process again, all the immigration process again. So it was kind of like decision make. And also um, all my grad school, my grad studies were financed by Mexico, like our NSF in Mexico is, is going to see. So I also kind of want to pay back um, a little bit of but I like, use my skills learned into like problems and, and I just pay back to the institutions in Mexico. So I'm, I mentioned Enrique and Patti, right? So they pop again in my life and they invited me to to help me. Well, we, we talk about some of the projects that they were going on like a, like a year before I was finishing my PhD. So I said, you can resolve that using stable isotopes. And I said, well, who's gonna do it? We don't do this in the, in the academic unit. And I was like, I said, oh, it's not that power. And I was just kind of giving them some tips here and there. And I said, why don't you come and do it? Finish your PhD and come do it. And I was like, well, I don't know. Like, I'm gonna go back to Ensenada. But I mean, everything back then, like at the end of my PhD was, was kind of line like putting pieces together and I said yeah it will work I mean I will come back and we'll have a job and I'm going to conduct research like in this and that and it kind of fit well so I put together the, uh, the proposal this is for a real research proposal got funded so I got this fellowship funded and off I go to the Caribbean again uh, so the project was uh, just to explain you quickly what it was about so um, we mentioned this spotted by Caribbean lobster which is a reef, uh, obligated reef dweller. So that means like, since it settles in the reef, it never leaves the reef. So it depends to totally on the reef. And the, the Caribbean spiny lobster like kind of like forage and moves into different environments. So um, when they, um, they well, as post larvae, when they are in the offshore, they come back into the vegetation areas in the coast. And then as they grow, they go back to the reefs. So they, that means that they use different habitats while the other one, since they settle, they live in the reef. So we want to see why these two guys can live in the reef as adults and how they compete, and what will be the effect of the, the coral degradation like that's a habitat for this guy that depends totally on the reef. So I use my um, stable isotope skills into that uh, to resolve these questions. So the transition to the to the Smithsonian was when we start looking into side projects. Um, and in, in this lab, Patty and Enrique have like a long story of, of, of monitoring recruitment in, in Puerto Morelos and in another base out in, 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 in the state, which is actually a marine, sorry, a marine protected area. So we wanted to see um, in this photo, can you see the, the, this photo? It is, so this is the, the latest phase of larvae of the Caribbean spiny lobster. And this guy metamorphoses into the, the this lobster, the, this lobster, this post larvae that looks like an adult lobster, just tiny and transparent. So this metamorphosis is incredible. So the, the graduate students wanted to see when this happens. So we have like, um, we, we, this is, we do some um, um, two campaigns, two oceanographic campaigns in the, with the, ship, uh, the vessels that I, I showed you earlier. And this is the, the the net that we use to collect the larvae it's, it's, it's huge and it goes all the way to 20 meters where the the, the, the larvae is um, during the night. So we start collecting from from the sunset, like uh, probably an hour after the sunset, it has to be completely dark, which is when these guys like migrate, they have a uh, journal um, migration. So they go a little bit closer to the surface during the night. So we we troll during the whole night in different stations looking for lobster. So they have, they have the students that they're gonna do the ecological part and how they survive. These guys, the, the post larvae don't eat. So we wanted to know where it was like the, the no return point. Like if they don't make it to, to the coast, when they're gonna die. So they were doing all this chemical um, ecology, like the, the resources that they have to, to keep going all the way to the coast and when they're gonna die. There was a lot of experiments going on, but I was going to do the genetic part of some of these recruitment, dispersion, and connectivity thing. And this is when I got in contact with someone who was joining the Smithsonian, Nate, um, Nate Trollope, who was joining this Smithsonian program. 
and the Marine Conservation Program, which is um, with Steve Box. And he said, well, we are interested in collaborating, collaborating with you. And then I met Steve Box in a, in a lobster conference. And I said, well, rather than collaborating with you, why don't you join my team? Um, so why not? So I was, I mean, it was after, at the end of my, my second year of that bag of funds for in, in, in UNAM, in Puerto Morelos. So choice five, leave Mexico again, which I was never, I, I honestly, I never, never thought that I was gonna leave or leave outside Mexico. I was gonna go back and do research in Mexico, but here I go. So last two years of PhD, a PhD of postdoc post post doing lots of research, mostly in, in the Mexico, Mesoamerican reef um recruitment see uh, to support like my, my reserve is going to support all the spatial planning that they were doing like in, in honduras they were they were uh, already working in spatial like in spatial ecology to to design an um marine protected network so their recruitment part was going to be just like support some of, of these uh, implementations for, for for conservation but well then during these two years i also Get to collaborate with Kong research and part of his research with Courtney, um, that trying to look for the, the, these these fishes are like great herbivores and a very key it's key species in in the reefs because they eat all the microalgae that overgrows corals, so they are banned now they are protected but we still finding them in in the fisheries in like in the restaurants and so one of our some of our well, many of the three, our field work was basically going and eat ceviches and fish dishes in the Mesoamerican Reef. So I accompany Corning to Mexico mostly and eat ceviches and collect samples from them and bring them to the lab and see if they were pirate fishes. And she did the same in Cayman and Belize and Honduras. So that was a fun field work. So very cool. Your ceviche connoisseur all over, all over. <laughs> But sometimes people, you know, they market fish as one thing and they not, they might not necessarily, you know, be that thing. I think something that's pretty apparent is that there's not a lot of transparency. Sometimes, I mean, some fisheries are better than others, but I think in certain, in certain fisheries, there's not a lot of transparency in like what is actually being served. So that's really interesting that you were able to order a dish and collect a little sample and take it back to the lab and process it and see exactly like, oh, this is mahi that we're serving you. And then you take it back to the lab and you're like, well, this is actually tilapia um, yeah, yeah. or whatever the case is. Yeah, it happens all the time. There are a few papers now that it's just like tracing all the, the or, or fraud in, in, in seafood, you know? So we, we, we ask, we ask first when we order and say, what is this? And they tell you, it's grouper. And it's like tilapia grouper. Like, when we come back with the results, no? So do we a lot of barcoding of, of fillets and fishes in, from, from that, so it was great collaboration, great meeting and these amazing people. We, we, at some point we were like six postdocs working in, in the same lab. So it was an amazing team. It was two years of, of Caribbean and I, I transitioned in a little bit more with for my lobster research into the Florida Keys, trying to find the origins and contribution of different countries to the uh, Florida Keys stocks. So it was the last paper I published on, on, on lobsters. So pretty neat two years of Caribbean research. That's really cool. We have a couple questions if you're if you're game to taking them now. Sure. So um, Juliet wants to know about the dolphins that you trained in Cancun. Um, did you have a favorite dolphin? Yes, Electra. <laughs> Electra. You pick me actually. Yeah, you wouldn't think like, but yeah, I mean, I have a few. Electra was probably my favorite. Oh, Shiana was the second one. But yeah, some. Um, they just pick you. It's just they are. They have their temperate. So, yeah, she was my favorite dolphin because they have personalities and you kind of form a bond. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I I, I remember. I just quickly going to tell you a, um, an anecdote. Um, I so I think I got ill, but I didn't go to the to the decks um, for probably a week. And then I returned, and then was like, okay, Aries, you have to jump into a program. As I told you, I, I I was not doing too much programs. I was doing more office and education stuff. So I jump into the water and here comes Electra. I didn't have it. I was not working with Electra that day, but Electra was like not paying attention to any trainer, not even the senior trainers. She just gone to me and she was pushing me against the gates. Like, and I was like, can someone take Electra please? And have Oceana with me. Like, and it's like, sorry, it doesn't work. I have to come out of the water and take Electra to another pen and like, like give her her time out because she wouldn't leave me. She was like, where have you been? So I missed you. I know. 
So I was there was great. There's some kind of experience that you see like, I don't know, they're touchy, probably it's a little bit cheesy, but I love working with dolphins. <laughs> they're super intelligent. I think they are. This is a great question too from Greer. And I think it's really applicable because here's you scuba diving um, on screen. Um, and Greer wants to know, has your love for the marine life and all of your work helped your mom become more comfortable in exploring the ocean? And have you gotten her to snorkel with you? She did. Uh, yeah, she did. She, she, she can change her mind. I remember I was still in my in my diving practice in Puerto Morales where she can visit. Okay, her baby was out of home, so she had to come visit. So I was still like, like in my dive course and it was one of my deep dives. It was like, oh, I don't know. I mean, let me think in, in very deep dive. Um, I don't want to think in feet, um, but it was like 15 minutes, 15, 15? No, it was 40 feet. Yeah, it was 40 feet dive. So she's like, you can jump with, you can come with, with us in the boat. Blah, blah, blah. And she was like, okay, um, but what I'm gonna do is like, you just put your mask and you just breathe through the tube and it was just very easy. And she did it, she did it. And she gets to see the, the reef and the reefs and she was like, yeah, I can see some rocks. He's like, no, there are no rocks, mom, they're corals. And so uh, that was neat. But you know, the funny thing is that she couldn't do it in the, in the, in the shore. Like I went to, with her to the seagrass beds and I said, oh, you have to see and like, see other things. She couldn't do it there. So I just throw her out of the boat and like 40 meters and she was fine. But she couldn't do it like just put the, the, the face in it like she couldn't do it but yeah of course like she she gets to love more than the sea life oh good yeah great questions everyone keep them coming we're gonna save a couple for the end but if you have any more as we keep talking we're gonna talk about how you transition to working in the caribbean to working in the indian river lagoon um but go ahead and ask your questions in the q a so Iris, do you want to talk about how you, you've been with the Smithsonian and you're still technically here, but you also have another collaboration in the works or you've, well, you have another choice to make before we get to that, I think. Yeah. But so it was uh, like, when I started in Michigan, it was like a, a compromise for two years, but then at the end of my second, uh, second year, we got another project funded, not in the Caribbean, elsewhere. So that was Myanmar. So Steve come me to his office and it's like you have this opportunity this project it got funded uh so i wanted to to take place with that like help me to 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 develop a lot more fishery science in myanmar uh but you have to move to dc with me for three more years and i was just like what and um i run to sherry the heart of the marine station. So I met her when she was the dive officer and I didn't really get to, to work directly with her, but this person was always there for you. Either like as a, a station manager to make sure all your work environment is fine, or just having her in, in the lab was just a, a reason to cheer for the day. And she was always there as a friend. And I ran to her crying like, Steve, want me to go to the sea? And I don't want to leave, like, and it's the reason why, like, Fort Pierce was home basically for me now. Like, I love Fort Pierce, it's a small town, but it's just like, like a beach lifetime. It's just very relaxing. I love living in Fort Pierce. I feel secure. I feel, I, I feel awesome here, but I also find Bill means love. So I didn't want to move. <laughs> I was like, I want to leave now. Like, finally, I'm kind of settling in. I'm going to move again. So Sherry was always there and like, to give you an advice, to give you a hug. So that was a great loss for, for us in the marine station. I know so, it's so hard. What was, do you wanna share what the advice she gave you was maybe? Bill is a great person. <laughs> so that means everything. <laughs> Bill is a great guy. So it's if you like, got, if you got, <laughs> if you got, I mean, Steve took it very well too. He was like, okay. We will not, we want to make it make it work. So yeah, this was the life choice actually. It's not like choice one, choice two. It was the life choice. Like you're staying here and this is calm and this is you are building your life here. So yeah, Steve is very considerate with that. Um, and we start working in, in Myanmar. So originally we were gonna work in crustaceans like lobsters, and they have beautiful lobsters there too. They have one that is called Palunilus ornatus, we had all 
I, I didn't find a photo, like my photo. I didn't want to put you as like a little photo, but they are beautiful. They call it ornatos, like Palomino's ornatos. Like, but they are like so beautiful. They're kind of like, ah, beautiful. So they have beautiful um, lobsters, they have a lot of fish, uh, lobster fishery, but they also have mud crabs. They are very important in the country. Blue swimming crabs. So I was kind of focused on that and my research. But then my first visit with Steve, we, we, we work a lot in collaboration with the fisheries department. So when we start talking about what things we can do as the Smithsonian Marine Conservation Program for them and help them to build um, sustainable, implement sustainability, uh, like science-based like um, management of their fisheries. So then you start jumping with, oh, you can do that. Can you do tonsil? Can you do that? Can you do that? And then, then we also, I, I gave a couple of lectures in, in, the, in Miyagi University in the Department of Marine Sciences. And they were like, we want to work with you guys. And I have actually some, have some students from, from Miyagi uh, University, I have a few PhD students. And of course I wouldn't make it with the, with the local partners. The, the fisheries department was all, all the time working side by side with us. And, um, and I mean, of course, there's the students in, in the collecting. Tuyen is also like is our um, program coordinator there, and he was helping me a lot. Of course, translating was one of the best, <laughs> the first thing that she, he will do for us. But yeah, so I, I end up working with I don't know like five different species besides like all the the catch and and barco. Like I have like a, a collection of um, a, that, a sample set of over a thousand samples, and I have barcoded all of them, and I, I am. That focuses on genomic uh, um, work, like in five scale um, structure to help to plan more uh, features regulation in, in the country. So this is still going on. Uh, unfortunately, the three years passed very fast, and I just like collect a lot, a lot of work to do. And but it, we, I didn't get to go to the whole thing. Unfortunately, the fine, um, funding for the pro for the country is not very easy. We work in strong collaboration with SEBI, the Smithsonian Conservation Institute. Um, institute, um, but it's still like um, to be, it, it's even hard for all the political issues. So um, international funding don't really want to to go there. But um, but that was kind of the story. Like, the, the, the fact. So that was my also like the end of my five years of postdoc. I cannot go more and um, more than that in five years. So also the end of my my immigration status here in the country. So but I wanted to stay and. This is uh, I I I um, my transition with 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 Harbor Branch was like which is, is actually our neighbor institution here in in Fort Pierce. They are just like a few uh, miles out, away from from the Marine Station. Um, but at the at the end of my of my no, probably, yeah at the end of my of, of my postdoc of my postdoc I took a course in genomics in California in the Catalina Island where. And yeah, Dr. Andy Chavez was uh, also a participant in the course. And later on, she got a position in Harbor Branch and she knew I was here and she knew my, my skills and my, my experience. So she invited me to collaborate with her in a big project in the, in the Caribbean that, that, that she collaborates to. So it's basically to understand how the, the, the natural disasters that I, that I um, yeah, not like, like, how do you say, like, disaster, like, can't find um, hurricanes, like, like major hurricanes or disasters impact the coral reefs, like, with a lot of focus in, 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 in sponges. So th this is kind of the, the main project that she invited me to collaborate, to collaborate with. So the transition between, like, it was at the end of my, um, of my fellowship in the Smithsonian to here, which I just started in Harbor Branch in April. It took a while because I mean you have to clear all your immigration status. So I was, I mean, and they want me to collaborate there, but I was not eligible for the position. So it took like nine months to to get all my paperwork um, in place. So during all this time, we started this, like I collaborated there. I volunteer my time there to get like the the uh, the, uh, the projects going on. I mean, move forward. And during this time, we're just like brainstorming about and with all the, all the collaborators in, in Harbor Ranch, how, what else can we do or other side projects that we can do. And this is when we came out like when to we, to work in, in the IRL and in, in our backyard, no? like I'm still kind of an hybrid between, I mean, I, I mean since I was not, I, I didn't have an affiliation when we put this um, then, um, 
So yeah, I was like in between, like clear on my, my side. So I didn't have an institution. I finished in, in, in between, but I was not a Harvard ranch neither. So we put this pay, we, a paper, a paper, a project that was funded to, um, to dig more into the uh, diversity of the IRL sponges and also in Fano with, with, with Holly, which, um, so we, yeah, so we came up with a dream team. Like everybody has their own skill, their own experience. And there we go, we jump into the IRL um, adventure. And it's just, it's just easy, you know, we are it's just right here is our, our, our lagoon. We love our lagoon. So we need to know more. It's, it's, it's named one of the most diverse lagoons, but we actually don't know much about some of the, the taxa and we are gonna find out and we are finding out. So we have an amazing team and here I am. Harbor Ranch Hybrid Smithsonian and building another year of my career. Awesome. I think that's so cool that you partnered with between the two, because I know that in the past, Smithsonian and Harbor Ranch have worked really closely together. So it's really, first of all, it's amazing that all your paperwork went through and that you were able to gain immigration status to get paid for this work and not just have yeah. to be here for it. <laughs> But um, it's really also cool that you're able to collaborate with, between the two universities. And it, it's a huge lagoon, so there's tons of opportunity. And I know um, one of the things that Smithsonian is really working on is this um, species inventory for the Indian River Lagoon. So like inventorying all the species. And if you guys want to check out that website, we just had a really cool relaunch of it. Um, so if you just type in Indian River Lagoon species inventory into your local search engine, I'm sure it'll be the first thing that pops up. And you can check out a bunch of cool species that we have cataloged and um, stay tuned for more creature features on our social media. So if you're like, what is even in the lagoon? Um, we will show you all the cool animals that exist there. But yeah, it's pretty cool because it, it, I mean, during the career, you see like one or other skills will help you to tackle different things. So I went from dolphins that are like recently evolved to sponges that have evolved like 800 million years ago so it's just like that super age um, ancient animals to like recently evolved animals and it's just with one tool you know that the genomic tools that help you I mean everything that has DNA has a potential to do this so that was a good school uh, skill to, to have in my career so we'll take some questions because I think we have a couple really good ones um and Rachel wants to know throughout your research maybe you'll have to um, pick something very surprising, but throughout your research, what results or findings were the most surprising? Um, wow. Well, maybe that there were two ecotypes. That was a huge discovery for the dolphins. Yeah, I think that, 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 that these two species, they two, yeah, these two morphotypes were distinguished as a subspecies was something that was really like, I feel, I feel accomplished. It was later on, it was news. I mean, the cetacean society in worldwide, they meet every year and they discuss the one, one of the papers that were in, in the discussion were mine. So, so that was very cool. Um, it was an international discussion to decide if they were a subspecies or not. Um, but I think, honestly, one of the most surprising for me, like recent is my lobster paper, my lobster research, like how, like, if you see these currents in, 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 in the south of Florida, this, you feel like everything swipes away. And I mean, how did how the, the lobsters um, come back to the, to, to, to habitats that are suitable for them, you know? Like they're just not going in, in the Atlantic. So I, I conduct this parentage analysis, like match baby lobsters to adults in different in countries, including Florida. And I found that many are like from Florida or are more related to, Flor to the Florida population. So there are these ways to like, the, how the, the larvae and the post larvae are retained, like they have mechanisms to be retained to close to home. I think that's one of the, probably the most amazing results that I have in, in my recent career Neat. or study. That's so cool. We have, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, you guys have asked some really good questions. I do kind of want to end with this one though, because I think it's really important and it's a three part question. So Iris, get ready. Wow. Um, Michelle asks us, so for young women in Mexico and other parts of Latin America, what's your vision for women in marine science in the future? That's part one. Part two is what should aspiring scientists look for in a mentor, which I think is a really great question. And I know you've had some really amazing mentors. So I would love to know what your advice on that topic is. 
And then the third part of the question is, what's the most valuable piece of advice that you receive that help you overcome any obstacles that are specific to women? Um, and Michelle also notes E en Espanol. So if you'd like to answer this question in Spanish, you're welcome to do so. Um, but I think you had a really interesting beginning because a lot of gender roles were kind of pushed on you and expected of you to just go into, like you said, accounting or into law where you could have a family and have like a desk job. But you said, you know, like, no, I don't want to, I'm going to do science and I don't care. Like, this is what's for me. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm Patty, for instance, did the same. And is one of the person that I admire, that I admire for her because, I mean, that happens to me in the 90s. I mean, when she was a student, she was also like, she really had to fight to go get out of home and do it. So I just feel like, I mean, being a scientist doesn't have a stereotype. There is no stereotypes in science. I mean, do, do, do you really feel that this is, this is your passion? This is, and you have to have passion for science because you have to. <laughs> There's no other way you can do science. So just follow, follow it, follow, follow that instinct and it will pay off. I mean, honestly, I don't make a fortune, but I live a living and I have traveled the world. I enjoy my every single day of my life. There are frustrating days in the lab. There are not a regular day. There's not there are happy days, there are frustrating days, busy days. Uh, but I love what I do. And if that's what you want to do, just break the stereotype and go and do it. And another thing is like one of the pieces of advice, a big uh, a big advice is. Don't let anybody tell you that you can do it. Just, you have to go and do it. And that's what I did. <laughs> Many people told me like, no, you're not gonna end a coin there. You're not gonna make a living, but you just have to work hard and you're gonna, you're gonna do it. You're gonna be successful. And third, the, or probably was the second. I think a common thing with all my mentors, advice and all the way to Steve Box is work with people that you like to work um be ethic be loyal to to your to your to your values like don't don't make anything tricky like you i mean do the leave the doors open keep your collaborators like you don't ever know when when a ball is going to come back and someone is going to make a review on you so just be just just keep your 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 work ethics clean and you will always have an opportunity so that's great that's yeah, that's one of the binds. I think both valleys, place in the hand. I know we have time for that, but <laughs> we are going to have to wrap it up. If you have any more questions, though, um, Aaron has put some resources in the chat for you. Aaron linked the Indian River Species Lagoon in inventory. If you want to check that out, we also have our Facebook and our Instagram um, there for you. If you had to jump on later or if you missed the end, this will be hosted on Facebook and we do put the recording on our YouTube channel. So make sure to check out those two places as well. Um, but Iris, thank you so much for sharing your career path with us. I really enjoyed um, hearing more about it and getting to interview you and talk about your story and sharing it with our audience. Thank you. No, thank you, guys. It was it was it was really cool, <laughs> very exciting, and it was very interesting for myself to dig into into my career. So it's pretty cool. I think it's really fun to go back and look through all those pictures. Yes. I know that's always a good. It gives like you haven't done it in forever, so it gives you like a nice opportunity to go and revisit that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. We're, if you enjoyed this program, please join us again on December 10th. I'm going to be interviewing Yes Marie de la Flor, um, an intern turned fellow turned contractor with the Coral Health and Marine Probiotics Lab at the Smithsonian Marine Station. Um, you can find the registration links for our live streams, like I said, on the Facebook page. So make sure to give us a follow or a like if you haven't already. Um, we share those links the Monday before. So our next career dive, like I said, is going to be December 10th. And then we've got one last one for the year on December 17th. So check the chat box because we have a lot of uh, really good resources there for you. But without further ado, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Adios. Adios. <laughs>